Now we're gonna shift a bit the perspective and look at personalized health and look at how we can prevent people from getting sick in the first place. Plus the context of all that. And we're gonna start with the context. Uh, and so to kick off the conversation, I want to bring in uh, live from California, Jane Metcalf. Uh, now, many of you may know her name or may know her, uh, but uh, probably all of you have been influenced by her work because 30 years ago, she was the co-founder of Wired magazine, which has been accompanying many of us uh, uh, through the digital revolution and for some of us even helping us play a role in, uh, in, uh, in it. Now she runs and edits Neo Life, which is a media platform looking uh, at the neo biological revolution. So let's see if Jane is with us. Jane, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent, excellent. Welcome to Sparks, Jane. Uh, Thank you. To start, uh, give us your definition of the neo biological revolution. So I consider the neobiological revolution essentially the next phase of the digital revolution. When we take all of our fancy digital tools and godlike technologies to engineer human biology, basically to transform our own species. What are you most excited about? Well, this is like asking me, which one of my babies do I love most? <laughs> there, uh, well, okay, sure, which one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I fall in love with technology. I get very excited about this stuff. And I'm very excited about using technology to transform health and solve some of the problems that have plagued us for, for um, millennia. Um, of course, the mRNA platform is astonishing and um, using that not only to create the COVID vaccine, um, but to do all kinds of treatments um, in a fraction of the time at a fraction of the cost, that's incredibly exciting. Um, you know, it's essentially biological software that can be used even beyond its therapeutic um, potential. So we're gonna see a lot of creative ways um, that mRNA can be used. Um, CRISPR is, you know, gene editing continues to evolve to become more precise. We're moving into clinical trials now for blood disorders like sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia, or lung cancer, genetic blindness. Um, there's a lot of exciting applications for CRISPR coming up um, in agriculture as well to help um, reduce the inputs um, like water, fertilizer, pesticides, um, create longer shelf lives, et cetera. But I'm also excited about non-invasive technologies like focused ultrasound, which is not just a diagnostic tool, but can also be used for treatment. Um, and other things like um, magnets and electricity for neurotech as opposed to invasive surgeries. But, you know, kind of over all of this is the role of artificial intelligence. And, you know, that can be used for everything from improved diagnostics, but, but it also helps us, you know, move beyond just reading into writing. And, you know, you can use a generative AI program now to create protein design machines and cell factories. So there's just, there's an explosion of technologies with incredible opportunity. And it's a very exciting time to be looking at these things. So Jane, this field is moving very, very fast, but it seems to be moving a little bit kind of organic. There is no master plan. There is no uh, strategic plan. Uh, you know, people are just tweaking and trying and, and moving forward and, 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 and so on. Uh, describe a bit the, 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 how can I say, the dynamics of this, of this space between companies and researchers and science and so on. Yeah, you know, when I first started looking at all these technologies, my thought was, wow, we now have the possibility of transforming, you know, homo sapiens. So what's our vision? Like, what's the, what's the strategic plan? Mm -hmm. Who's got the creative brief? What's the product roadmap? You know, it's just this stuff is springing up. And whose job is it to think about the future of our species? Um, and, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, as scientists, um, people are trained to become experts, but they're experts in an increasingly narrow field as they go deeper and deeper into it. And what we need to do is move from the kind of mapping that we've been doing, ah, here's the cell and here's how it works, here's the molecule, here's how it works, into thinking about these things as like complex systems. And we need experts in one field to be able to be neophytes in another field, to be able to say, okay, here's what I can bring to the table. What do you know? How can we put this all together to understand the enormous complexity of, of the mechanisms here? And also, you know, think strategically about where we're going. I don't, you know, most of the molecular biologists I know don't want to be responsible 
solely responsible for making the big decisions about how we deploy these technologies. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned before that you co-founded Wired almost 30, 30 years ago. What kind of similarities do you see, and especially what kind of lessons did we learn from observing and, and accompanying the digital revolution that could be useful today if we take them into consideration? Well, I think about this all day long. Um, I mean, for one thing, you know, we built our first computer, let's say, 100 years ago. Um, and we're pretty good at reverse engineering that and understanding how it works, you know, and my favorite engineers will talk about their technology working auto magically, you know, just as if, um, you know, humans have evolved over the course of millennia. And, um, you know, they, they are still full of magic and mystery and messiness. And there's so much we still don't know. We don't even know how many different types of cells there are in the body. We don't really understand the fundamentals of the human immune system. So, you know, magic and mystery uh, make the neobiological revolution a lot different than the digital revolution. Um, but it's also a completely different risk profile, right? I mean, we're talking life and death here. And, you know, it's also a highly regulated industry, whereas, you know, with the digital revolution, there was no regulation in place. So, you know, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the digital revolution, but this is really quite different. Jane, to, to end, you are chairing a big project called the Global, uh, the Human Immunome Project. Uh, it's new, it just started, uh, but it promises to be a big global collaboration. What is the Immunome? What is the project? Tell us a little bit about that. So the Immunome is, um, what is the Immunome is a question we can debate for a very, very long, <laughs> very long time to come. Um, what we consider the Immunome is the, the cells, the organs, the tissues, the molecules, that make up what we consider to be the human immune system. Um, but it's also your entire omics stack, you know? So it's your genome, it's your epigenome, it's your transcriptome, your metabolome, your microbiome. Um, it's, it's all of that stuff happening inside your body, but then it's also the exposome. It's all the stuff happening outside and around you. So that would include the food that you put into your body, the pollution and your toxins in your environment, you know, the stress that you're under, um, so in order to really understand how the human immunome functions, we need to build a, a predictive model, a quantitative model that takes into consideration all of these different aspects and looks at this not as a 2D cartography exercise, but as a, a 3D complex system that we have to model, that, which is actually 4D because we have to model it over time. Your immune system as a newborn is not the same as your immune system as an elderly person. And so, you know, we are looking to computational models and machine learning to help us understand both mechanistically what the underlying mechanisms might be that we haven't been able to observe or experiment on, but also phenomenological models that can give us patterns and information um, that can help us move forward even when we don't understand the underlying science. Mm -hmm. So the Human Immunome Project is, is, you know, it's kind of like the next stage after the Human Genome Project. It's, it's a global collaboration of scientists across all these disciplines coming together with this big audacious goal that some people think can't even be done yet. But, you know, we're confident that with the group we're assembling, um, and the vision that we're setting out, that we are going to learn a lot um, and we're going to move the field forward in ways that we are only beginning to understand now. Who's, who's involved now and who should be involved? It's an incredible group. We came together at the end of September with about 65 scientists from an extraordinary um, research institutions and academic institutions, you know, Harvard, MIT, the Broad, um, Scripps, uh, UCSF, also in Europe, in um, the Middle East. Um, it's um, immunologists, computational systems biologists, machine learning experts. Um, it's people who are willing to think about these difficult challenges that we'll have, who are willing to share their data, to come together in a spirit of open collaboration so that we can move this field forward. And anybody who wants to contribute to this, I mean, I've been able to go to my friends from my Wired era um, and get people very excited from the um, AI side of things. They're very excited about having these enormous data sets um, that come out of the health and medical field and what they can do with them. 
So anybody who um, is interested in helping us move this forward, who has any of these skills, is welcome to reach out. Um, it's uh, it's it's going to take a village. It's going to take the whole world to make this happen. It seems it seems to be a pattern in today's discussions. It's going to take a village. Jane, thank you very much for joining us and for sharing uh, your knowledge with uh, the audience at Sparks. And uh, enjoy the rest well, of the day in California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to be with you.